Yeah, after the strong linguistic adults, you may not want to party tonight, but... Uh, You'll need a drink. <laughs> you, you also need a drink, right. So, um, so first I would like to introduce my uh, graduate school advisor, Dennis R. R. Preston. Um, he was at Michigan State before he moved to Oklahoma State two years ago, so that's where I did my graduate study. And he was a great mentor, and he spent hours hours analyzing data with me and revising my thesis and measure things. So <laughs> I owe him a lot, and I'm so happy to have him here. Uh, finally, it was my dream to invite my advisor to uh, where I am teaching, so I, this is my dream come true, so I'm very, very happy to have him here. Um, so about him, he is a well-known dialectologist and social linguist, both nationally and internationally. And he is, as I said, he's currently teaching at Oklahoma State, uh, where he's a regents professor. He has been extremely active in the fields of perceptual dialectology and the variationist social linguistics, among other fields. And he also served as president of the American Dialect Society in 2001 and 2002, and served on the executive committee of Linguistic Society of America from 2005 to 2007. And did you serve any other significant committees? No. He's, he's half retired now, so. But he's been also uh, traveling a lot um, uh, so he's been invited to give a lecture or teach a course at so many international and national institutions. So he constantly travels around the country and around the world. So I feel we are very lucky to have him here today that, that he could find actually time to come to Wittenberg um, in his busy schedule. So today he will talk about folk linguistics and his title is What is Folk but so recently, what is folk linguistics? So why should we care? But I think the new title is uh, this. But it's the same talk. It's the same talk. <laughs> so uh, please welcome Dr. Preston. I think you can see the screen nicer on number four, what it says here at number four. <laughs> Tehumi, thank you very much. I, uh, I remember Tehumi and I as, uh, as my student with the best posture, but that's not the best thing I remember before. Uh, I, I remember uh, Tehumi and I sitting in front of a computer for, it seemed to me like five or six years, I'm sure it wasn't quite as many uh, as that, but actually analyzing 30,000 tokens of Japanese vowels to determine whether or not those vowels were devoiced or not. And to see whether or not a vowel is voiced or not is a very tricky spectrographic uh, and impressionistic combination. It, it would be nice if you just looked at a spectrogram and said, uh, no voice, and it would be over. But there are unfortunately maybe 20 or 25 percent of those 30,000 vowels sometimes left us uh, panting a little bit about whether or not there was really a voice signal there. And so I, I think we actually had one criterion, the very last one, was, did it sound voiceless to me? Don't ever tell anybody uh, that that was a scientific <laughs> criteria. But, uh, but Terumi wrote a spectacular dissertation. It, uh, it establishes social contours and gender contours for vowel voicing in Japanese for the very first time. Uh, everyone assumed that it was just a feature of the standard language and had no idea that it had sociolinguistic significance. So you're, you're very lucky to have the queen of Japanese vowel voicing here on your own. <laughs> <laughs> So, thank you very much for inviting me here. I want to talk about one of my hobby horses, uh, folk linguistics. And let me get right to uh, the business of what I mean by folk linguistics. Now, let's be sure that we understand one another about the folk and what folklore is. I use folklore in the technical, folkloristic sense. Folk is what, uh, folk stuff is what people believe who are not scientifically engaged in an endeavor. So, folklore does not mean false or strange or outlandish. It simply means that real people, not scientists, believe it. So obviously folk linguistics is the same thing as folk chemistry or folk biology or folk zoology or anything else, right? If you're a zoologist, if you're not a zoologist, everything that you know about zoology is folklore. Eighty percent of it could be true. So please don't confuse folk with false. Yeah? So why do we want to do this? Why, why don't we just, you know, trust linguists? Uh, and say, okay, if there's scientific information to be had about language, we'll get it from you guys, and the rest of us will either get a drink or take a nap and leave us alone. Uh, now, first thing you should recognize 
is since, uh, since the scientific enterprise of linguistics deals with something that many people don't regard as scientific or never think of as a science. You might try this experiment sometime, take a piece of paper, wander around the campus, and ask people to list the first 25 sciences that pop into their mind. I bet you almost nobody will put linguistics on the list. It doesn't have scientific regard, even though it has incredible scientific foundation. I just talked to you about the spectrographic work of Dr. Emai, and I could refer to neuro-linguistic work where we cut people's heads open and look inside and see what their language is doing. So it's obvious to science. I mean, you don't, can't look inside brains unless you're a scientist. Uh, so, so, but the funny thing is, is that since part of it is a social science, then what real people know about language is, in a sense, not only more interesting, but uh, more eventful than what real people believe about chemistry. So that when something happens in chemistry, and somebody from the newspaper says, oh, there's been some advance in chemistry, what department do they call? The chemistry department. But when something happens in language, or you need an opinion about language, or language change, or a strange language that's found in the Amazon, or something like this, journalists very often don't know what department to call. It doesn't occur to them that linguists do linguistics. I mean, in fact, well, you know this yourself, right? Uh, or certainly all of us linguists know this. We go to a party and people say, what do you do? We don't go to many parties. We're very hard working. But when we do go, <laughs> and you say, well, I'm a linguist. <clears throat> and then they always say two things. How many languages do you speak? Because that's what linguists are supposed to do. And in fact, in the military, the title linguist means person who speaks another language. Well, I, I knew a very famous uh, dialectologist at the State University of Stony Brook. Oh, I shouldn't have said where he was. But he spoke English and nothing else. He was a linguist. He was an accomplished linguist, right? Because he did scientific studies of language. The second thing, of course, which is even more annoying, is that when you say you're a linguist, then people say, ooh, then I better be careful how I talk. Oh, please don't be careful how you talk, because I study the way people really talk, not the way people talk when they're being careful, uh, which is usually a kind of mess. Because when you talk and you're being careful, you, you mess up your language some all. So why do this folk linguistic stuff? First of all, if you have any anthropological or ethnographic interest at all, how could you possibly give an account of a culture, a people, a group, unless you knew what they believed about language? Not just what they did in language, but what they thought and believed about language. There are groups, for example, who believe that if you teach your language to anybody else, it is an enormous sin against the culture. There are other people, of course, <laughs> like speakers of English, who believe that unless everybody else learns your language, that you are kind of stupid. But at any rate, you see, to, know, to know something about a group without knowing what they believe about language, what role it plays in their culture and society, seems to me to be a big gap in the ethnography. Uh, just looking at an old, thank goodness, old anthropology book that was laying around, you leave lots of old books laying around here. And there was an account of a group, uh, a small tribe in Australia, and I just thumbed through the thing, and it's their culture, their language, their, their bows and arrows, their ladders, how to get into their huts, and not one word about their beliefs about language. So as far as I was concerned, it might have been a very good book, but it was worthless because it didn't complete the ethnography of that group. 